All right. Hi. Yeah, we're just in time, and uh, Sky Out is going to tell us something about VX, the underground virus scene. And um, I'm thrilled about this talk because, you know, my parents opened a email, or my dad opened an email that promised um, cheap gas prices and <laughs> some insider information about cheap gas prices. And yeah, a hacker took complete control of his computer. And uh, one year later, my mother opens the same email. Crazy. So welcome uh, Sky Out about the uh, VX underground scene. <laughs> okay, can you all hear me? Well, perfect. Okay, so what shall this speech be about? Well, it shall be an introduction and overview about the whole virus scene. You will be introduced to some of the groups, some of the techniques and keywords we use in our scene, and you will learn about our ideology. That's very important for me. You shall understand why we code viruses, why we do it, and why it is not our aim to harm somebody. So, let's start here with React the Virus Underground. Okay, so first of all, some facts about me. My real name is Marcel Dietl. Well, introduced as Sky Out and better known in the internet with this name. I'm 18 years old, actually, and I come from the nice city of Wiesbaden, which is in Hess, in the middle of Germany. The last two months, I worked for MK Media Concept in Wiesbaden, which is a little web design company. But um, until uh, starting in February, I will work for Daimler Technology Services and Solutions as a penetration tester in Ulm. Uh, well, what to say about me? I'm Gothic. I'm a social engineer. And I'm an autodidact. And there are three major things. Security, cigarettes, and coffee. So I'm addicted to the CCC, of course. OK, the term VX, what does it mean, actually? Well, VX, of course, C11H26NO2PS. No, that's not what we are talking about. It's not chemistry here. VX means virus exchange, or in our case, it means virus coding. So originally, the term was meant for people who exchanged viruses, who sent them to each other. But nowadays, most people use VX as a synonym for virus coding. So we will talk about virus coding today and virus coding techniques. So VXers are the people coding or exchanging viruses. And they form groups to do this with other people. And those groups we call the VX groups, simply, isn't it? So what groups do we have in the scene nowadays? Well, first of all, we have 29A, which you can find under www.29a.net. It's a very famous group, and it has brought out many assembler viruses within the last years. It has a forum at the moment where they publish viruses, but it seems like a bit they are dying nowadays. But they have great e-signs, and what an e-sign is, we will talk later about it, don't worry. Uh, by the way, 29A is a hex code of 666, which is quite interesting. So what next? RRF stands for Ready Rangers Liberation Front. It's a German crew founded by Filetoast and other guys. Seven years ago, it has brought out about seven or eight e-signs. Very interesting stuff in it. Check it out at rrlf.de.vu. What groups else do we have? Doom Riders, written with that, of course. Doomriders.co.nr. Doom Riders is an American team originally founded in America by a guy called Sin Flash and others, and is now leaded by Wargame from southern Italy. What is interesting about Doom Riders, especially? Well, in America, writing viruses is illegal. But still, they do it. They want to show that they fight for 
their ideology. They show the American law, even if you make us criminals, we won't give up our hobby. Then we have Purgatory. Purgatory is an Iranian team, which you can find under purgatory.net.tf. F13 Labs. Uh, similar to 29A Labs, F13 Labs is built out of international VXs and has quite interesting stuff on the homepage. So this is just to introduce you into some groups and so you get some internal information. EUF, my favorite one, because I founded it. Um, EUF-project.net was founded by Radiation and me in 2000, let me think, seven, no, six, sorry. And we brought out our first e-sign in 2007. And it's one of the most active groups nowadays. It has a forum at vx.eof-project.net, which you should really check out if you are interested in virus coding, because there are many interesting links to learn. Last but not least, NE365, which is the whole reaccess of China. Also in China, it is not easy to code viruses, so they are really like underground. Okay, so the ideology behind it, what I told you about. We want to learn something about ideology. So what people do we have in the scene? First of all, of course, we have the criminals. They are coding viruses to harm somebody, to build up botnets, like we heard before in the Stormworm presentation, to make DDoS attacks or whatever. Well, but those people are not the VXers, or at least not the VXers, what I call VXers, crazy sentence. So we won't look at criminals. What else? Hobbyists. Hobbyists are quite interesting. They come and go. So a hobbyist is someone who likes coding for many years, normally, and he wants to e explore something new, and so he codes a virus. And then he's happy and goes again. Those people don't help the scene a lot. What's more important are ideologists. What is an ideologist? An ideologist is somebody who really codes viruses because it's his ideology, it's, he loves coding viruses and the mysterious thing in coding, and those people are very important for the scene because they keep it alive. And very interesting, I, com I like to compare v the VX underground with the hacker underground because we have white hats and black hats. So what is a white hat in a VX scene? A white hat is somebody who does code viruses like a hacker codes, for example, hacker tools or whatever. But he does not do this to harm somebody. He does not spread binary versions of his virus. He just codes it, exchanges the source code to conduct knowledge exchange, but does never ever spread a virus. In comparison to this, we have the black hats who really spread viruses and often are in prison now. <laughs> yes, it's true. Most of the, them are in prison, like Wave, for example. Okay, let's look at history, present, and future of the scene. Okay, how was it in history? Well, the first worms, or let's say, yes, the first worms came out on floppy disks. It was really simple. You had a floppy disk infected with the virus, you gave it to your friend, your friend inserted it to, into his PC, and boom, he got infected. That were simple worms. Then the Windows OS became more and more popular, and more, more worms targeted Windows. So the really interesting worms, like Sasa, Netsky, or whatever, are made for Windows. So that was the history. Simple viruses spread by floppy disks at first worms for Windows and mainframes as well. Now, the present is quite interesting. What do we have at the moment? We have a quite criminal scene. Uh, we have botnets that get built up, many spyware and adware, 
and we have more viruses for Unix and Linux based systems, of course, more viruses in scripting languages, more, uh, more uh, cross-platform. But what I want to say when I say we have many criminals, never forget we are talking about the VX scene that are not the criminals. And how will future be? Interesting question. Actually, my crystal ball got broken today, but I guess I saw something like Bluetooth malware and mobile device malware in it. So there's an interesting article by Marco Rogge in Hacking Magazine about Bluetooth malware, and I guess this will be the future, mobile device malware. I could be wrong, but I guess. So let's talk a bit about cross-platform malware, because it's a common trend at the moment. OK, first of all, how can we achieve cross-platform malware? Well, we have macroviruses, for example. What is a macrovirus? First of all, let's ask what is a macro. Let's imagine we have an office suite like OpenOffice or MS Office that runs on many systems. For example, OpenOffice runs on Unix, Linux, Mac OS X, and Windows. MS Office, MS Office even runs on Mac. So a macro is like a little automated routine that's get, that gets executed when the document is opened and there's no other security like forbidding macro, uh, macros to run. So a macro virus that does nothing else than execute itself when the document gets opened. And the interesting thing about it is, for example, when you are on Linux, you can find out with a macro if you are on Linux. So you can write a dropper especially for Linux. If you are on Mac OS X, you can write a dropper for Mac OS X. Some of you may ask, what's a dropper? A dropper is nothing else than a simple program that gets dropped into a file and gets executed. On Windows, for example, you could drop a bad script that kills or formatted the HDD. On Linux, you can write a Python script that gets dropped and spreads over XChat or whatever. And on Mac OS X, you could write a Ruby dropper, for example. And just to say it, it was done. There was an open office swarm, especially done with macro viruses called Bad Bunny. And if you want to find out something about it, just search for Bad Bunny open office swarm in Google. You will find some interesting stuff. OK, .NET and Mono. I won't say that much about .NET and Mono, but it's a common trend to use .NET at the moment. Many people like to code in C Sharp code in Mono, and it will run on .NET and Mono, and therefore it runs on mostly every system. There is a good presentation by Paul Sebastian Ziegler, also known as Tatsumori, about this um, at the, don't get me wrong, Black Hat conference in Las Vegas called Cross-Platform Malware Within the .NET Framework. It shows perfectly how malware could spread over the .NET Framework because it runs on every system. OK, scripting languages are interesting. I love scripting languages, actually. A scripting language has an interpreter. Those interpreters mostly run on many systems. Python runs on Unix, Linux, Mac, Windows. So if you code a virus in a scripting language, you can easily execute it on different systems. Low-level languages are the most difficult ones. You could write a virus in assembler, for example, that changes its behavior within the system. So if it is on Linux, it acts differently than when it is on Windows. That is like the, the most difficult one to code, a low-level cross-platform virus. But a good example is Linux, which is a combination of Windows and Linux. This was a very good example how to code a virus from different systems and really hit the news. So we talked a bit about spreading. OK, but what spreading techniques do we actually have? OK, floppy disk. Yeah, I mean, many people use floppy disk, don't we? Um, no, it's not up to date. But there are still viruses really going by floppy disk. So what is more interesting are CDs and DVDs. 
Um, you have a great auto start function in Windows. We all know it, and it's so good to use it. Just write an auto start, f auto start uh, virus that copies on a CD, make an auto start for this exe file, insert it, and boom, the virus gets executed. Very nice. Thanks to Windows for helping us. We access so much. What else? USB drives. USB drives are cool. <clears throat> there are new USB drives coming out that actually are like CDs and DVDs. They have auto start functions and it's like the same with CDs. We code a virus, we copy, we check if there's a USB inserted, we copy on it and we spread it. But those techniques have one big disadvantage. They all need somebody who puts the stick or CD or whatever in. So it is not really automated. So let's look at some automated techniques. P2P networks, they are really great. Not also for sharing porn, but also for spreading viruses. You have normally a program like Shariza or DC++ or whatever with a normal folder where you can put all your stuff in it you want to share. And well, a virus does nothing else than copying itself at this place and it gets shared and you give it a great name like Windows Vista Crack and people will really load it and it works. What else? We have share hosters. How can we imagine spreading a virus by a share hoster? So a share hoster is lump, something like rapid share. So Imagine a virus you loaded up to RapidShare, you make some advertisement in forums and blogs, and people click on the file, download it, and execute it. That's a way to spread a virus, and it really works. Email, the standard way to spread a virus. I think I don't have to say much about emails. We all know it. There are many example source codes out there, how to spread a virus by email. And the Stormworm uses this technique, by the way. Bluetooth, as I said, Marco Rogge wrote an interesting article about Bluetooth malware and I bet it will be the technique in the future. IRC, well, that's cool. IRC is very interesting and there are many viruses out there that spread, for example, by XChat on Linux or by MIRC on Windows or XChat on Mac OS X works as well. And it's very simple. You code a bot that waits in a room and when a new person changed you DCC him and say hey I have a file don't you want to share it or don't you want to have it and you send it to him he looks at the file and well that's it he's infected with your virus ICQ MSN just like IRC messages are sent out to all contacts in the contacts list network shares that is interesting if you are in a LAN and you have network shares where you can write on, you can pu just put your virus onto the network share and if people are stupid, um, well, stupid enough, yeah, let's say stupid enough to click on it, they will get infected. Wares, of course. So also be careful with wares. They are often infected with the viruses. It's logical because people code those wares and they don't get money for it so they make their money by coding viruses as well and putting them into wares. What I really like are exploits. Exploits are very great for spreading. There have been big warm spreads out, um, in the last years that used exploits for example for servers like the SQL server of Microsoft or similar. So exploits are really great for coding viruses, but they are mostly used by oh, sorry. They are mostly used by criminals and not by the whiteheads, what we call the VXs. So now you saw a bit about spreading techniques. Just to give you an overview how we code viruses and worms and spread it. Just a moment. Okay. A virus is a program that reproduces it itself. So how does it reproduce itself? 
where we have different ways. We have an appender virus. What is an appender virus? An appender virus appends its own code at the end of the original code. Imagine a Perl script. You have a Perl script, and the virus puts its code at the end of a Perl script. At the beginning, it does a jump to the virus code, and then the original code gets executed again. Similar to this, we have a prepender. Imagine a Perl script again. A prepender puts its code at the beginning of the file, executes it, and with a little delay, the original file gets executed again. Last but not least, of course, we have overwriter viruses. They just overwrite the whole code with its own code. They are the most destructive ones. So what types of payloads do we have? First of all, what's a payload? A payload is everything else than reproduction. So reproduction is the normal thing a virus does, and a payload is like the rest. Could be closing all windows, could be changing the start page of IE or whatever. So what types of payload do we have? Conspicuous payloads. What is a conspicuous payload? Well, I define a conspicuous payload a payload that really wants to make the user realize that he got infected. Could be a message box telling you, hey, you got infected by virus XY, sorry, by ZY. That is really conspicuous. More interesting are inconspicuous virus, and most criminals do inconspicuous payloads. For example, the projects by Joanna Rutkowska are very interesting examples for inconspicuous payloads because the viruses put the whole OS into a virtual machine, which is not recognized by the user, so it's totally inconspicuous. Poly and metamorphic viruses are very interesting. They change their, be, they, their way of acting every time. So you code this virus and you can't be sure how it will act in 25, 25 reproductions later. They are really like the big ones. Anti-debugging techniques are very interesting. I have written a virus. Uh, it was released in EOF magazine number one. Remember EOF minus project.net that shows how to do anti-debugging. For example, Oli debug or whatever. And you can write little routines for your virus that check if they are debugged. So this can be a payload as well. OK, so we talked a bit about virus forms, drawings, whatever. But I haven't defined it yet. So let's define it now. What types of malware do we have? Well, first of all, we have a virus. Yeah, really. What is a virus? A virus is a program that starts with an infected host file and reproduce it itself to other files. A worm is a vir like a virus, but it spreads externally over the internet, over the LAN, over what else. A drawing horse is a program that simulates a normal program, could be simulating a game or whatever, but silently it executes evil code. And we have a hoax. This is just a joke, virus. OK, ways of communication. So now we talked a lot about viruses. Now we come back to the VXs themselves. So how do they communicate with each other? Well, first of all, over file servers. There are great file servers out there. And if you bought this little book or read my um, article on hacking, you can find a link to a file server. Um, I don't remember the URL right now. Well, a good file hoster is vx.netlux.org. It has many viruses, source codes, and binary viruses as well. And this is the way vxr communicates how they conduct knowledge exchange. Websites, of course, every good VXA has an own website where it shows his stuff, his source code. Emails are mostly used if a VXA plans a new project and they want to make it silently, they don't want the public to realize it. 
So they are writing emails to each other. Same with ICQ, MSN, Yahoo. So something interesting now, IRC. IRC is the medium for reactors to communicate. And because of this, I wrote down some good channels for you, which you can find in irc.undernet.org. First of all, EUF minus project channel, reaccess channel, virus, vx minus lab, and vir. There you will find mostly every reaxer in the world. But just a tip, don't go there and spam. You will be kicked. People are really, well, the access are careful with strangers, so it would be better if you code a little virus, show it to them, and then they will trust you more. The access are not using silk. Even I would suggest them to use silk because it's more secure, they love IRC, and they will ever use it, I guess. E-signs. E-signs are the most important platform for we access to communicate with each other. What is an e-sign? E-sign stands for electronic magazine. Imagine an e-sign like a little folder which has different subfolders full of sources and tutorials and articles and mostly you have an index.html file that links to every special source and article that is in the e-sign. So it's like a really little PDF could it be or whatever. And it comes out mostly once a year by one group. So what connection do we have between VX and AV? Um, VX and AV. VX, VXs, virus exchanges, and AV antivirus companies. So it's a fight. It's always a fight. VXs are coding viruses and the AV are trying to beat those viruses. What more? It's an observation. It's like the access are observating the AV company, looking what they're doing, and the AV company are blogging about the VX scene. For example, F-Secure has a very interesting blog where they really write, write a lot about the VX scene. But the most interesting thing, infiltration. There were really AVs who tried to infiltrate the whole VX scene and they had some success. For example, Peter Ferry is known for such nice things or uh, other people from Kaspersky. Very nice company, really likes us. Um, and they go into the channels I just named you, um, simulate an VXer and try to find out, real name, find out real names of the people sitting around there and just get them into prison. So that's the worst case if an AV company tries to beat the scene and really destroy it. What is the best case in the connection between VXers and AVs? The best case is a VXer writes a virus, just a simple virus for Windows, whatever. It sends it to the AV company. The AV company can now analyze the virus, of course. It analyzes the viruses, virus, can make a string for it for the database, and <coughs> can uh, save uh, secure their customers. And then they put a description on the page and this is like a trophy for the VXer. So we have three little steps. The VXer writes a virus, sends it to the AV, the AV analyzes it, puts a description on the home page and the VXer has a trophy. It's good for everyone. The VXer has a trophy, the AV can secure the customers. That would be the best case, but as we have seen, we have worst case, destroying the scene. So what used languages do we have? Well, first of all, as I said, .NET languages are getting more and more popular. C Sharp .NET, VB .NET, and what else .NET. They are really interesting for cross-platform malware, and as I said, cross-platform malware is the trend at the moment. 
Windows languages are still the languages in the scene. Many people start writing viruses in batch or Visual Basic. It's simple, it's easy, it's good to start. Scripting languages. Scripting languages like PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby, whatever, are very nice and the interesting thing about or the difficult thing. If you have a scripting language and you write your virus in a scripting language, you always have a binary and a source code in one. So it's hard to only show the source code it is the binary as well. And of course we have the HLLs like C, very ex good example for an HLL, a high level language. I love C a lot. Many people code in C and C++ nowadays, but the best or the most respective thing you can do is coding your virus in a sampler. And that's what 29A, the group I talked about, it talked a bit earlier, coded their viruses in a sampler. It's the most difficult language nowadays and yeah. Well, go on. So which problems in the scene do we have nowadays? Well, we have one big, pro or one of many problems, but one problem is the size. There are really not many reactors out there. Um, you can say we have about 50, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less active reactors. So we really need new reactors. So please all write viruses if you are finished here. We need new people. So that's a problem because if somebody leaves, it's really difficult. And that's the next problem. We have a continuous change. I talked about the hobbyists. They come and go. They code a virus once a time and go again. So this continuous change really makes it difficult for the scene to keep alive because groups die, groups come, groups die. Decentralization, that's interesting. What is decentralization? Well, I mean that every group tries to do its own thing and instead of working together. For example, EOF project brought out its own forum. Now, 29A brought out a forum. Other groups make their e-signs. No group can do an e-sign for themselves, but they don't work together. This has changed now. EOF, Doom Riders, and RRLF are doing an e-sign together, which is really great because now things hopefully get better and we access work more together. But it is still a problem that we access don't work that much together. At least it was in the last years. And it's based on a few hosters. So I talked about vx.netlux.org, a very important VX hoster. Um, located in the Ukraine, I think. Ukraine, sorry. And just imagine this hoster would be shut down. Many sites would go down as well. So we have maybe about two to three important hosters that host hundreds of viruses and source codes, which are really interesting from 20 years, from the last 20 years and if they would go down, it would be disaster. So, the relation between social engineering and VX. It's mostly used for worms. Social engineering is very important if you are a criminal or if you are a VX that just wants to show it's possible to code a very good worm. Imagine you write an email and it must look interesting. The text must be trustful so people will click on the attachment. So social engineering is very important for VXers because they must know how to write their worms, how to make the, for example, when you code a virus, a worm that spreads over P2P, the file name must be interesting and similar things. And of course, VXers need social engineering 
to be careful and to analyze everybody in the channel because in many countries it is illegal to code viruses. So we experts are very careful underground society and they need social engineering to save themselves. So conclusion of all this. What I want to show here was first of all give you an example of some groups. We made this. You learned a bit about the different groups we have seen. You learned a bit about the spreading techniques which was very important. So we had a mix mixture of technology, spreading techniques and similar things and you got some internal information, for example, the IRC channels where you can look now, where you can inform yourself, or you can look for the bad bunny worm, or whatever. But what I really want to show here, what shall be clear, we act for we access coding viruses is a way of expressing themselves and it's a way of creating art. We access are not coding viruses to harm anyone or any system at least most reactors, and most reactors are whiteheads, it's like 95%. So, never forget the ideology of most people in this scene, in this little scene, and it's not the criminals, which are most people nowadays, are peaceful. So, the next time when you hear about a good virus that is spreading, don't think everybody is the same. There are people who code viruses as a way of hacking, as a way of writing code in a special way. Thanks. Okay, we have a lot of time, so we can make a little discussion if you want. Bam. Um, yes? Uh, just a moment. So, first, first question would be, in the beginning and the end you uh, told us what you are going to talk about or what you talked about, which is why c coding viruses isn't the bad thing, at least not necessarily. But the whole talk wasn't about this. Um, so. I still don't know, I mean, if you, if you code, if you're a hacker or something, and in this particular view of writing viruses, I understand that writing proper, writing good, writing elegant code shows some kind of skill, which is control yes. of the language on a hopefully high level. But first thing I don't get is what is the equivalent for social engineering? I mean, what skill do you show? Do you show the skill to manipulate people, to trick people, to... Um, kind of misuse a web of trust form in our day-by-day -day interactions with persons. I mean, what is the skill you prove when you do social engineering for like screening viruses? So this would be the first question. Well, you mean what is the skill in doing social engineering? Yeah. Well, isn't social engineering a skill? I mean, social engineering you can use exactly for coding viruses. Your virus gets better when you are better in social engineering. Oh, I'm, I'm not asking what the use of social engineering. I mean, what, what is the, the benefit, what personal cap capability you, you prove when you do social engineering besides tricking people? Because, I mean, tricking people, you... Yeah, yeah I think, um, well, you prove that you understand how people think and act. I mean, when you are a social engineer, I feel like maybe I should say what I define social engineering. Social engineering is understanding how people think and act and making yourself react in those things. Um, well, it's hard okay. to understand. Got this one. Um, se second one would be um, like you, your best case scenario for the interaction of yeah. uh, writing um, viruses and the antivirus um, <coughs> companies. Uh, the best case scenario was you write a virus, send it to the company, and the company um, spreads the uh, patches and signatures and, um, to its customers. Isn't this basically uh, like protection money earning? I mean, basically it means that everyone who can afford protection gets it, and uh, the 
people writing viruses profit from it and the company profits from it, but all the people not paying money for it don't, well, suffer the consequences which you put into terms of stupidity. I mean, of course, um, a lot of people are like stupid behavior with their computers, but those people paying money maybe are too, but they don't suffer the consequences. I mean, when this is the best case scenario, I don't know how much is into the social engineering thing. And yeah, and the um, ethical don't aspects. Don't you think it's best case scenario or what? Pardon? Don't you think it's best case scenario? <laughs> D depends uh, if you afford the updates. Ah, more questions. Hello. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of your speak, uh, you you told me um, that you that that you we access don't uh, want to spread the virus. Yes. And, and you don't even uh, make binaries of it. Yes. Um, so my question is, uh, why do we why do we have troubles when it is true what you said? with anti-virus companies. Why uh, do we have troubles when you don't why spread Why we have troubles yeah. if we don't spread it? Yes. Um, well, could it be like the question why it, it's similar to the question why it might be illegal in some countries if we don't spread it binary format. Is this what you mean? Why it is illegal? Why it is a trouble? Well, it's very, I would say it's very simple to make a binary virus about um, out of a source code. So many AV companies think, hey, they show their source code and many people can just take the source code and make a binary virus. And that's a problem. We, the VXers, just code a virus to show the source code and to conduct knowledge exchange. We don't want to harm anybody, but there are those criminals, they really take our source code, put it in their viruses and spread it. It's, it often happened in the past is that you saw a great idea by Weaxa, how to spread a virus. He never wanted to spread it. But then a criminal took this idea, coded it into his own virus and spread it. So what the AVers don't like about us is that we show new ways to spread viruses. And so we make their life harder. We show techniques how to hide your virus in front of the AV program. They really don't like this. They don't want to have people who show how to hide a virus. They don't want to have people who show new techniques. Of course, for us, it means making security better. It's like with hacking. When you show a new vulnerability, you normally, as a whitehead, want to make the system more secure. It's like a VXer. He shows a new way to spread a virus and wants to make the AVS react. But they don't like this. They don't want new problems all the time. Is this what you mean? Yeah, okay. OK. This sounds like some hypocrite hypocritical organized crime because you help them um, by spreading your giving away your uh, source code they make money with viruses because if they were one there they wouldn't have any job uh, but still they attack some of you uh, well don't you think this is kind of, first of all unfair and well, it's a bit similar to the question if we should release vulnerabilities, isn't it? I mean, if we now make a relation to hacking, we have this quite similar. In VX world, we have people who write a new virus and show the source code, and others can take it to really spread it. In hacking, you have found a vulnerability in whatever, Apache web server, and now it is a question if you really release this vulnerability, and then people could take it, of course, to attack an Apache web server. Or if you don't release this vulnerability. Now it is the question, you for yourself must be sure if you want to make it like full disclosure or not. And most reactors are for full disclosure. They are pro full disclosure, so they think by showing those viruses, we make better security. And of course, it's fun. Really, sometimes it's simple, just fun. They want to piss a bit at the AV and make their life harder because the AV companies have done a lot to break us down and so sometimes we are just angry and code viruses to make their life harder. But I don't think that, I don't think that anti-virus companies
guys are, are upset to you. I think without people like you, they wouldn't exist. That's an interesting thing. Well, so if they depend on you, that's what I do. Yeah, that's interesting. Many people think so. It's very complicated. Take the word anti-virus. Yeah, and we make the viruses, of course, without us. Yeah. Well, without us, there would still be the criminals, of course. But the criminals might not find such techniques. Um, well, it depends. I think also criminals could find new techniques, new things to make viruses better, but I think it could work without us, but it's more interesting with us. We make their life harder. They have something to do. We make work. Of course, great. And other thing, you mentioned hoaxes. Yes. Um, okay, you say you do viruses and you don't want to harm anybody, um, but to prove that hoaxes work, you need to send them out on, on the internet. It does not really harm people, maybe, uh, but it does piss off a lot of them. Yes. <laughs> what do you have to say against this? What do you have to start? To say it does not really harm people, but pissing people off does harm them, I guess. Well, hoaxes is very interesting. Actually, what I said, you could send them out. It does not harm the system, really. So it would be OK. If there's no data manipulation, I think it would also be legal. It could be legal in some way. But um, we normally don't spread binary formats. And well, to be honest, most reactors just don't code hoaxes. Hoaxes are more coded by some pupil or student who just want to scare his neighbor a bit. So I haven't seen a hoax in the virus scene for well, I have never seen a hoax in the virus scene, actually, in the last years from the important groups. Of course, there were hoaxes, but the important groups and their electronic e-science, uh, electronic science, hadn't any hoax. So how do you prove your social engineering skills if you don't, if you don't distribute to the hoaxes? Ah, OK, I see, I see. Well. Um, for example, I wrote a virus, or better call it a worm, that had different uh, email, emails uh, in its code with different subjects and texts. And I mean, people saw, hey, if this virus would execute, it would send this, this, this email. So people saw, hey, I have a social engineering skills. My emails are really look trustful, but I don't have to send it to prove it. You know what I mean? Mm, not really. <laughs> <laughs> if you look into the source code, you can see what the virus would do, but you don't have to really do it. Yeah, but technically, if you code a virus, you can say, OK, I, you take advantage of a fault in a system, or, and you can prove, OK, I made this virus, it works. It's just in, in theory, you can say, OK, it will work. Um, in social engineering, you can say, OK, I wrote this uh, pseudo hoax or whatever. Uh, you, there's no way to say it will work or not. Well, yes, you would have to spread it to really prove it, but we won't do it. But you're right. To really prove that it works, you would have to spread it and test it in live examples. But normally, it should be enough to just say, it could work. You know I wrote a hoax, and it could work, but I won't spread it. I hope it answers your questions a bit. Yeah. And yeah, one last question before I go. Um, have you already distributed <laughs> a binary virus before? What, what, what? Have you already distributed binary, binary virus before when you were? If I were? distributed binary virus, yeah. never. OK. Microsoft software. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Hi. Oh, hang on, please. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned earlier that there is an increasing number of uh, Linux viruses. Um, can you go a bit into detail into that? Details about Linux viruses? Yes. Um, well, um, it's like with Windows. Windows is very popular, so there are many viruses for Windows, of course. But Linux gets more and more popular, and there are many viruses coming for Linux. I give you an example. Um, I talked about scripting languages. Scripting languages are very in interesting for viruses because they run by an interpreter. So there was a nice example, for, ex uh, for example, there was a nice example by Synch Flash, who code coded a PHP virus that ran on a web server and infected all the PHP files. And if now a user served this web server, he got infected. This is an example for a new way to code a virus for a Linux platform. And so more and more people try to target also web servers. And they are mostly running Unix and Linux. So it's increasing. And because of the new Windows, Windows Vista, more people switch to Mac OS X. I heard a statistic that 60 or 50 to 60 percent think about switching to Mac OS X because of Vista. And you have a Unix base in, in Mac OS X. So writing viruses for Mac OS X would be like writing viruses for Unix-based systems. So the more people use Linux and Unix, and it will come that more people use it, the more virus you have. At the moment, you have maybe 100 viruses for Mac OS X, a few thousand for Linux, and hundreds of thousands for Windows. But it gets more for Unix and Linux platforms because more and more people switch to those platforms. Uh, I have a question. Uh, if this well, where oh, the sorry, micro? Are you, are you yeah. OK, I have a quick question. Um, if there's only 50 of you really in the scene, um, here I am on, you know, I work for an anti, I don't work for an antivirus company, but say I did work for an antivirus company, what would it take for me to buy you all out? You know, because all I do is there's 50 of you, right? And you, I just pay you all to be my research staff. And that's the end of the problem right there. And I have a stranglehold in the market. And uh, you can worship me as your commercial god! Sorry. But, you know, it, the, the, you know the, I mean, it's actually, a quite, it's actually quite a valid question. Because why, what is to stop you guys um, setting up your own research, you know, going into commercial business and setting up your own research shop and actually selling on, if you like, the results of your research and keeping it, if you like, within a closed, a closed loop um, so that, you know, these, you know so the techniques that you come up with and the like don't actually leak out to the criminal world. I mean, I'm, I'm a little surprised if the numbers are so low that there is no discussion or that you have not actually seriously discussed or considered this. Oh, yeah. What? That's a very good point, actually, you know. So maybe I should go into sort of like the Russian mafia porn business or something. I, I'm obviously not thinking big enough. Sorry. It's uh, okay. Okay. Um, just first a comment and a question. Okay, I don't think uh, the world is white and bl black and white, like you said. Okay, it's 95% uh, of good guy, a 5% of bad guy. You know, maybe you have to include, I don't know in which side, you know, uh, like uh, information warfare government branch we are using uh, as well, uh, virus and so on. And maybe to take into account that some of the people have the skill and the money. Maybe you have a skill and money. But some of the other people have a skill and no money, like in some uh, emerging countries. I don't want to mention because no need. And uh, some of the people have the money and can buy that skill. So when you, have to, you need to, you know, to, to eat, maybe you, do, you have no choice to, 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 you know, to say, OK, I have a morale and I want to develop a virus for the bad things. Maybe you just have to, to get the money and you will develop the virus. There is an asymmetry of the knowledge uh, in the society. And uh, some of the people of the emerging country are just doing that for survive, you know. So it's not as, as simple as just summarize to good guy and bad guy, you know. But anyway, there was a comment. And uh, my question is, do you think in, for the 2008, uh, you will an increase of virus to Macintosh? And this virus will be compatible to iPhone, maybe? <laughs> Thank you. So your question is if Macintosh viruses will increase? Yeah, and com 
compatible to iPhone, those viruses will be maybe compatible to iPhone? Oh, very interesting question. Um, well, actually, I think yes, because as I said, I guess in future mobile device viruses will get more interesting and the iPhone is a very interesting target for virus writers because there have been found in the last months several vulnerabilities in Safari browser. They helped to execute shellcode on the system and I bet it will just be a matter of time until people code viruses that exactly execute code on the iPhone. And of course, as I said, if 50 to 60 percent think of switching to Mac, just only if 10 percent would really do it, this would be enormous increase in Mac users. So with increasing Mac users, viruses will increase as well. It's just like natural behavior. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned that uh, metamorphic and polymorphic viruses were uh, pretty, uh, very interesting, very exciting. Do, um, do the VXers use a lot of cryptography to uh, randomly shuffle uh, instructions and repack the code and that sort of thing? Do they use what? Cryptography. Oh. Implemented correctly with the good um, uh, let me think a random moment. number generation and... Yes. Uh, many reactors use cryptography uh, nowadays and uh, maybe as a good example I could give you here now uh, ransomware would be a good example. Um, there was a great code by a war game from Italy. I mentioned him before. He is the leader of the Doom Riders team from America and he coded a great ransomware that crypted all the files on the hard drive sends an email to the, pe the person get, who got infected and says if you want your files back, pay money. He never executed it. He just showed it would, it would be possible. And there are many viruses nowadays in scripting language as well as normal language that, that use simple cryptography just like XORing or very advanced things. So yes, we access use it. Any more? There are still questions. Uh, you use some uh, exploits and other leaks of uh, OSs. Uh, did you ever consider contacting the vendor before you contact the antivirus company? Like uh, Microsoft or the Open Office or? Uh, you mean if I should c contact the vendor instead of? Contact the vendor first and then uh, let the um, In the example of the Bad Bunny virus, it was very interesting. We first contacted the AV company, who then informed the vendor itself, but the reaction from the Open Office team was quite um, not surprising, very um, disappointing. They just said, well, it's not a real worm, it does not work. And if you're stupid enough to click on a macro, it's your fault. And they really talked about it like it wouldn't be a problem. So we normally don't contact the vendors because they don't believe it would work. So we contact the AV and they have the power to make a story out of it. Uh, my question is about what happened if somebody gets your code, make a binary and attacks and the BND is searching for you? because the code is of you. What happened? <laughs> Whoa. Uh, it's illegal in Germany, I think. Um, well, it's still not illegal in Germany to code <laughs> viruses. They wanted to make a law to really make virus coding illegal, but they haven't made it. So I might get asked maybe if I had th something to do with it but normally they couldn't uh, make any problem to me. Okay. It's, it's still legal, really. Any more? Comments, questions, 